Morning, everyone. Thanks, Damalola. Morning, everyone. How are we doing? Okay. Pete started this kind of trend of sitting on a stool, and so I, I thought I'd just, you know, who am I to contend with him? And I'm going to try and do the same thing. Maybe some of that glory will, will kind of come through the words. We'll see how we go. Um, well, welcome to KXC. Welcome to church. It is great to have you with us. Great to have you with us on the live stream if you're joining us via there. Uh, via there. My name is John. If we've not met before, um, hello. It's good to, to be here with you. We're in this series together looking at Psalm 23, and it's called With Me. Psalm 23, this beautiful psalm, which we're going to read through together in a moment. And it's part of this songbook of the psalms that were written um, by the people of God. They're songs of worship, they're songs of lament, they're songs of pain, they're songs of praise and everything in between. And each of them has a slightly different vibe, a slightly different look and feel to them. And an Old Testament scholar, a guy called Walter Brueggemann, he gives us a bit of a framework, a bit of a, um, a sense of context of, of how we get these psalms. You might notice some of the language. It sounds kind of familiar. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. If you've been here for any length of time, you'll know it sounds awfully similar to creation, decreation, recreation. Now, all I'm going to say is this was written in like the 1980s. So... No guesses for where this kind of language came from first, but who am I to complain? Anyway, so orientation, psalms that sing of the praise of God. They're an overflow of worship. Think of Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. It's simply an overflow. It's an overflow of love and of praise. But we get these psalms that are psalms of disorientation, as Brueggemann would call them. Think of Psalm 88, Lord, you are the God who saves me day and night. I cry out to you. I know that you're there, and yet I am overwhelmed with troubles. My life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. Why, Lord, do you reject me? Brutally honest. In some ways, beautifully, beautifully honest. Such barrenness that we see in these psalms. But then he says we have these psalms that are psalms of reorientation. That even though we go through pain, we can still praise God and we still know that he is good because we know the closeness of his presence. And that's what this psalm is all about, Psalm 23. Though we walk through the wrong, down the wrong paths, he guides us back. Though we go through dark valleys, we don't need to fear evil. Though we might be in the presence of our enemies, a feast is prepared for us on a table in the middle of it. That's where this psalm is coming from. So we're going to read this together as we are every single week, and then we're going to go from there. So let's say together, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my cup with oil. My cup overflows. Almost, almost right, wasn't it? A little bit of a typo, last one. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be zooming in on verse 3. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Let's pray. So, Spirit of God, we welcome you in this place afresh. Lord, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're moving. We thank you that you dwell with your people. And we ask, Spirit of the living God, would you come and open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to encounter you afresh. Speak through your word, Lord. Speak by your spirit. Amen. Amen. So he refreshes 
our soul. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. He refreshes my soul, literally means in the, in the um, Hebrew to bring me back. He carries us back to the right path. And this part of Psalm 23, it speaks to a sheep. We're going to learn a lot about sheep, as Pete said in the first week. It speaks to a sheep who is lost. It speaks to a sheep who is vulnerable. It speaks to a sheep who has fallen away from the rest of the group. It's isolated. It's alone. It's in danger. But there is a good shepherd who will go after it. There's a good shepherd who will find it. And there is a good shepherd who will bring it back. And Pete did say we were going to learn a lot about sheep, and that enables me to do my kind of biannual deep dive on TikTok sheep videos. And there are some absolute crackers. And yes, we're going to be watching a few of them. But there are three things that we need to know about sheep for today. And we're going to learn that through this repository of TikTok videos that are available to us. The first thing is this, that sheep need the flock. Sheep need to remain in the flock. They're highly socially interdependent. They follow the direction and movement of the flock wherever it takes them. They don't know, they don't care wherever the flock takes them. It is instinctive to their nature to follow the sheep around them. The social instinct to a sheep, it, it's so strong, it's so deep that they literally need eye contact with sheep at all times. They need to be able to, that wasn't even a joke. <laughs> Good to see a couple of laughs there. They need to be able to see the flock at all times. Here's our first video where we're going to learn a little bit about that. There's the flock. They're all having fun. Oh, no. <laughs> He's lost control. Oh, they've gone. Okay, I need to go and find them. The sheep need the flock. That's the level we're at, guys. That's the first five minutes. Sheep can't see straight. That's the second thing we need to learn. It's not even that funny, guys. I'm, I'm actually trying to make serious points here. We'll see how it goes. So contrary to popular belief, sheep really aren't that stupid. And contrary maybe to some of the videos that we're about to watch, they are not that stupid. They're incredibly intelligent animals, but their eyesight is a little bit odd. Their eyes are obviously on the sides of their head, which means their peripheral vision is amazing, but they literally can't see in front of them. If they need to see something, they need to go right up close to it, turn their head, and before you know it, they've lost the rest of the flock. They've wandered off somewhere else exactly, Iona. Oh, it's sweet, isn't it? But they've gone. They've gone. They've lost it. And it means they don't know where they are half of the time. And if they go up close to something, they lose all perspective. In fact, they need to go up so close that they don't even understand what terrain they're on. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they're going. And you know what we're going to do now. Here's one example of that case study number one. So this lovely guy is trying to get this sheep out of the ditch. It's fallen in there. It's vulnerable. It's on its own. It's free. It's incredible. It's running away. And in it goes. <laughs> Horrible to watch. Horrible to watch. Case study number two. This is a variation on a theme. This incredible shepherd, this farmer, has made a selfless act over, the, over that stream. Get this sheep out of there. It's running away. It's running away. No. No. Tough to watch. They can't see straight, guys. That's literally what happens with sheep. Thirdly, sheep become cast. Now, those of us who aren't farmers, those of us who aren't shepherds, we're going to be a bit confused about this language. I want to do a little bit of deep dive into what a cast sheep is. A cast sheep is when it literally falls over. It rolls onto its back and gets itself stuck. The more it struggles, still not funny, guys. I don't know where, I don't know where the humor is coming from, but is it just because we're talking about sheep? Is it funny? Okay, fun. Um, the more it struggles, the more embedded it gets, and it starts flailing around helplessly. Its legs are going in the air, and it cannot right itself until it eventually gives up. It waits to be rescued or simply left to die. So let's watch a video of that. Now, guys, I'm going to be honest, that has absolutely nothing to do with a cast sheet. But on my deep dive of TikTok sheep videos, that one was too good not to put in there. And I didn't know what else to associate it with. So just have an image of a cast sheep that needs to be rescued or indeed needs to die. Anyway, 
Hard to segue from there, isn't it? Sheep need a flock. They can't see straight. They easily become cast. All of these factors genuinely mean that an isolated sheep left on its own is incredibly vulnerable. It quickly becomes prey for things around it. It gets incredibly isolated. And that's the picture we're left with as we come back to Psalm 23. Now get rid of the TikTok videos because we're not going to be coming back to those. That is not the the image that we are left with. We're left of this isolated, lonely, vulnerable sheep. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And that might be exactly how some people in this room genuinely feel as they walk into this place. You might feel isolated, like you've drifted from the flock You've lost eye contact with those around you. You might feel confused. You don't know the terrain that you're on anymore. You you felt like you did. You used to know what was going on, and now you're not so sure where you're treading. You might feel like you're cast, that you're flailing around, that you're paralyzed on the floor, and the more you struggle, the more you stay there, the more you're embedded into that place. And Pete said a couple of weeks ago, many if not all of us are operating right now with a level of societal, of cultural trauma that we've experienced over these last few years, let alone all the stuff that you'll have going on in your life. And it's in this context of that challenge that this psalm, it reorientates us towards God. That's where this psalm is going. And there is so much in this simple verse that I think is for us today and here's the great the first great comfort we can take from this verse that he comes to get you like if you're feeling in any of those groups right now if you're feeling vulnerable if you're feeling alone if you're feeling exhausted from flailing around in the hope that someone will see you and come and help you he is coming to get you he comes to get you Philip Keller is one of our our guides over the course of this series. And going back to this cast sheep, he says this, a cast sheep is a very pathetic sight, and you can imagine that it is. Lying on its back, its feet in the air, it flays away frantically struggling to stand up without success. Sometimes it will bleat a little for help, but generally it lies there lashing about in frightened frustration. Farmers will tell you that a sheep can become cast for for one of a few reasons. Some of that might be its own doing. Some of it might be the circumstances around it. Let me know if any of this sounds familiar. Maybe they found a comfortable spot. It's somewhere they could rest their head, that they could lie down, a cozy corner, a hollow to rest in, which at first felt like gift and created rest, but it soon became a trap. It soon became the very place that they couldn't get away from, the prison with which they could not escape. They could be pregnant, they could be carrying new life, literally weighed down by the burden of something new. Or thirdly, they might be just having too much wool. They might have too much wool on them, weighed down by the matted, dirty, long wool that they carried. Throughout scripture, by the way, incidentally, wool symbolizes an old life. Like they might be carrying something of an old life that they need to shed. It's not for them to carry anymore. Look at something like Ezekiel. It says this, when they, he's talking about priests, when they enter the gates of the inner court, they are to wear linen cloths. They must not wear any woolen garment while ministering at the gates in the inner court or inside the temple. In other words, shed off your old life. Don't carry your old life into something that has been prepared for you to live out your new life. Shed off the long wool. However they got there, the sheep urgently demand the attention of the shepherd. And you can understand why. Because it not only demands the attention of a shepherd to make sure they're okay in case they're there for a prolonged period of time, it also commands the attention of predators. You look at one shepherd who talks about this, and he's writing about what he would do, and he says, I look at the sky. I don't look at the ground. I don't try and find the car sheep on the ground. I look at the sky. Why? Because when I see the birds circling around, I know that I haven't got long. I need to go. I don't just need to to make a point of going there at some point. I need to run because it is a race against time for that sheep. The enemy, the predator, 
looks for those who are isolated, looks for those who are vulnerable, looks for those who are alone. But God comes to get you. God comes to get you. If you're feeling isolated and alone right now, you need to know the promise that God is going to come and get you. God will come and get you. This, this last season for me has been a really weird one. Um, before Christmas, I ended up feeling really, really low. And it came out of nowhere. It felt like it was just a bit of a shock. And um, it culminated in the moment it really kind of twigged for me. I was with a group of my mates who gathered for my birthday. And we were having a great night. It was absolutely brilliant, brilliantly hosted, thanks, Steve, just before he gets any kind of preconception that it wasn't a good night. It was a great <laughs> night. Um, it was an incredible night. But here was what happened. I realized that I was having an awful time, and nobody knew. Nobody knew. None of my mates, the closest people around me, realized that I was struggling. Why? Because I hadn't let anyone in. I hadn't let any of that group in, realizing that I was really really struggling. And I, I was drawn to something that a text that I'd sent years before, about eight, nine years before to a friend. And I was doing a different job and I was, I was kind of trying to think through what was the future and what was God calling me into. And I, I remember sending this text saying, I, I don't really understand what this means, but I'm in. That was it. I'm in. I don't know what that means, but I'm in. And I went back to that text uh, later that night and And I started writing a new one to that same person. And I just said, you know what? I I actually don't know if I'm in anymore. I feel like I'm out. I feel like I'm out. And of course, there's things you can do with that, right? There's actions we can take. There's things that we can do that help us move on from those seasons. And yet my biggest prayer in that moment was, God, I know that you will come. I know that you're here. And I know that you will lead me back. We all go through seasons where we're hovering over the text send that says, I think I'm out. Don't kid yourself that you don't have those moments. We all have those moments. I think I'm out. And your biggest prayer in that moment could be, should be, Jesus, I know that you'll come. If I wait here long enough, I know that you will come because I know that you're a good God. Many of us are figuratively hovering over that text right now. I know it because I meet with you. I know it because I speak with you. You're wondering, am I in or am I out? And the answer is God will come for you. He will come for you. Hold on, hold on for hope. So not only will he come to get you, but he brings you back. He doesn't leave you where you were. He doesn't leave you where you are. He will carry you back. And we saw earlier this phrase in the psalm, he refreshes my soul. It isn't quite right. It more literally means he will bring me back. That's a promise, by the way. He will bring you back. And many of us might have a decent awareness of what it looks like in the struggle, in the pain, that God is with us, that he's with us when it's hard, he's with us when you're struggling, he's with you when you're feeling and experiencing trauma, and yet some of us have a lack of understanding of what he might do next. Because do you know what he does? He will put you on his back, and under the incredible strain of what it takes to carry a sheep back to the flock, he will carry you back. He will carry you back. So traumatized and scared are sheep so often when they're found, particularly when they're cast, when they were on their back flailing around and so terrified that the shepherd will often need to just sit with that sheep for a while until it calms down. And then often they won't be able to walk. They'll put the sheep on their shoulders and start walking slowly back to the flock. God will bring you back. God will bring you back. One of our other guides over this series, Kenneth Bailey, says this, the open wilderness in the Holy Land often exhibits a maze of faint trails worn by countless flocks of of sheep. The shepherd alone knows which of them leads out of that valley to the next stage of the day's journey rather than abruptly ending in some dead end or cliff edge. Philip Keller says something similar. Sheep are notorious creatures of habit. If left to themselves, they'll follow the same trails until they become ruts, graze the same hills until they turn to desert wastes, pollute their own ground until it's corrupt with disease and parasites. And we know that we do this all the time, right? 
We know what the right thing is to do. We often know that God is with us, that he's around us, that he's leading us towards something good. And yet we find ourselves at the end of one of these tracks, grazing the same ground that isn't healthy for us, settling for a way of life that we know could be better. And honestly, we settle. We settle. We often say at KXC, misdirected loves lead to misdirected lives. A tiny miscalculation at the start, pointing ever so slightly away from God, away from his purposes for your life, eventually leads us far away. Far away. You just miss the track by a little bit. It's not hard to do. We all do it, by the way. And it leads you somewhere very far away. A tiny set of decisions way back when that once felt good for us. Not quite processing pain that well. Turning to things that give us comfort, which slowly develops into addiction. After addiction, after addiction. Not quite taking that deep desire to the right place. Turning to things that will meet that desire in a moment, but will ultimately break your heart. Not quite dealing with unmet ambition or purpose in your life. And so striving to make it in the world. I will make it. I will make a name for myself to prove your worth to those around you. Even to yourself. But being totally exhausted in the process. You will feel exhausted. And these are idols. These are idols. This is where we take unmet needs, unmet desires, the very real needs and desires to all the wrong places. C.S. Lewis says this. We often quote part of this, but the whole quote is so beautiful. These things are good images of what we really desire, but they are mistaken for the thing itself. Sorry, but if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshippers, for they are not the thing itself. They are only a scent of a flower we have not yet found, the echo of a tune we have not yet heard. News from a country we've not yet visited. And when we fall for those idols, it leads us to the ruts. It leads us to the desert waste, to the corrupt grounds, as Philip Keller calls it. We're a million miles away from the TikTok vids, aren't we now? (laughs) So back to our isolated sheep. The shepherd stands in front of the sheep with the offer of bringing it back, back to lush grass, to the flock, to his care, back to safety, to haul the sheep onto his back. And the sheep has a choice. The sheep can continue to flail around, pointlessly moving, pointlessly feeling frustrated, helplessly panicking, or to allow the shepherd to pick it up. It's no more action than that. It doesn't take any more than that. It says, you can take me. Take me back to the flock. Take me back to safety. And some of us, honestly, right now, we're so busy flailing around. We don't know what to do with ourselves. We haven't even realized that the good shepherd is standing right in front of you, patiently waiting. It's not that he will come to get you. It's that he's with you. And he wants to take you back. His greatest desire is for you to be in the very place where you can thrive where you can live well, where you can live in freedom. And he waits. He waits for you to stop flailing, and he will take you. The good shepherd not only comes to find you, but he will pick you up. He will take you back and guide you along the right path. And finally, our verse in Psalm 23 has this little bit at the end that we could so easily ignore. And the way that we live our lives, we know that we ignore this one all the time. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. This is all not for your glory, not for you to just become a slightly better person, but for his glory and for his fame. And it shouldn't surprise us that we find ourselves down these paths, isolated from the flock, struggling to see straight, to understand the terrain we are on. It's kind of inbuilt into this story, this narrative, this brokenness of our story. And I want to take you to Isaiah 53. This is the great prophecy of the suffering servant. It's pointing towards Jesus. It's pointing towards the salvation story that God is unfolding. 
And um, it, it says this, right in the middle of it, in the thick of it, it says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. Now, that's not surprising. That's pretty familiar to us, bearing in mind what we're looking at today. But that is buried in the middle of this whole chapter. Now, you don't need to read it. Don't worry. Someone's looking at me like, come on, John. We need a bigger font size than that. You don't need a bigger font size than that. In the gold, you can just see on the left-hand side, written down, that's the verse. But if you zoom out, the subject of this prophetic narrative, it's not us, it's the suffering servant. That's where the glory resides. Everything that's ringed is about him. Not about us, it's about him. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. He was despised and rejected. Surely he took up our pain, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was oppressed and afflicted. He was like led like a lamb to the slaughter. Can I let you into the worst kept secret of our faith? You're not actually the center of the story. This is not a story all about you. We don't live in a modern Truman show. This isn't just about you becoming a slightly better person. I'm sorry if I'm the first person to break that to you. If you thought you were part of a self-help kind of cult and we're all just having a good time, we're all really friendly, we have kind of semi-good coffee and we enjoy free food every so often. That is not the purpose of this. This isn't about you. It's not about God coming to save you so that you might be a slightly better version of yourself and get promoted in your job next year. This is about him. He wants you for himself. And he wants himself for you. He wants perfect relationship, utter union with you. That's what's on offer here. Not a little bit more money next year. He wants you. He wants you. This is about Jesus. He comes to get you. He sits with you in pain, in the suffering, until you're ready to be carried back. Why? For his glory. For his glory. So that his name might be glorified. And that we might be united with him once again. And I want to close with this. What, what does it mean for us? What do we actually do with that? And I think there's a movement we're being invited into. There's a posture we're being invited into. And it's one of repentance. It is one of repentance. Metanoia, this Greek word for repentance, literally means to turn around, to reorientate yourself upon God. And some of us right now, we do feel pretty isolated. We feel lost. We feel lonely. We feel confused. We might feel cast. And there is a simple reorientation to make. It's one of repentance. It's one where we turn to the shepherd and realize that he's right in front of us. He's standing right in front of you and he wants to carry you back to new life. He wants to carry you back to the safety of the flock under his care, under his protection. Pete mentioned earlier about what's going on in Asbury. It's this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. However you define what's going on there, it's, it's amazing and it's beautiful by all accounts. And you might recognize the name because on the top left, that was a, a photo taken in the 1970s. And it's a place, it's a Methodist uh, seminary where people train for Methodist ministry um, and, and other things as well. Um, and it was a place where there have been moves of the spirit over decades. It's a, it's a room, it's an auditorium where people have encountered the spirit in a fresh way that's happened generation after generation after generation. And the photo bottom right is a photo taken in these last 11 days or so. A very simple service that took place last Wednesday, 11 days ago. 12 people stayed behind simply to encounter the Spirit in ministry. That was it. 12 people stayed at the front and they clung onto the altar in desperation, in repentance, and said, Lord, we're not worthy. Here's my stuff. Will you move in power? That was as simple as that. And thousands are now coming every day to try and witness what's going on there. It's starting to spread by all accounts. It's moving to other universities around the US. It's a movement through young people, which should excite us. Incredibly exciting. It's humble, it's simple, it's authentic. But at the very core of it is confession. At the very core of it is repentance. It's not loud noises. It's not just arms in the air saying, God, you're amazing, although it is that. It's people coming to the front and saying, here is my stuff. Here is my stuff. 
I want to turn to you again. Someone who was uh, sent a message to a few of us about what was going on, he said, people are pouring out their gunk before God. That's at the core of what this is. Deep brokenness being left at the altar. That is a move of repentance. It's a move of repentance. And so we're going to respond to that and see what the Lord wants to do. So why don't we stand together?